Good morning, everyone. Today is July 22nd, 2019, and the Select Committee on Homelessness and Housing Affordability will come to order. It is 10.50 a.m. I'm Teresa Mosqueda, Chair of the Committee, and joined by Co-Chair Councilmember Shama Sawant. We'll soon be joined by Co-Chair Councilmember Sally Bagshaw, and also joined by Council President Bruce Harold, Councilmember Gonzalez, and Councilmember Herbold. Thank you all for being here today. We do have uh, three big items on today's agenda. A uh, first is a briefing on the Human Services Department for Performance Metrics update. The second is an update on the navigation team expansion. And the third is going to be a more robust in-depth update on the regional governance work group. Uh, we wanted to make sure that there was plenty of time for this. I know in the past it's received a short uh, allocation of time and we wanted to give a chance to get into the details in terms of how those discussions are going so far and make sure all the council members have a chance to ask any questions at this point uh, before we get into uh, late summer and fall. We are going to take public comment today, but it will be at the end of the agenda because we know we also want to hear feedback from the public on those three agenda items and uh, appreciate you all signing up. I do have one full sheet um, in front of me and look forward to seeing the other ones if there's folks who've signed up as well. We'll get you all in before we leave here today. At last, um, I would say the last three public meetings, we have had robust, robust public testimony on the need to make sure that we're protecting the ability for those who created um, small, uh, tiny home villages to have a self-determination and really uh, make sure that we're investing in all of our tiny home villages and listen to the concerns that have come up around governance. And we appreciate Councilmember Sawant bringing forward a letter that many of us signed on to uh, recently. And uh, while we uh, will hear public comment on this later, I'm sure that this issue will come up. So we'd love to have you provide a brief update, Councilmember Sawant. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Mosqueda. Yes, as you said correctly, uh, we had begun a mediation process with the support of many community members and organizations and residents uh, of Nicholsville and all the independent members who are uh, part of the various Nicholsville boards. And the, a draft of that letter was first sent around on May 26th. And since then, we've had a very important select committee. The, the last select committee, as you all, our community members uh, probably know, but if you don't, then it's an important update. We had a discussion here on the dais, and uh, all council members agreed that this is a productive, this is the productive approach to take on, which is uh, bring together the two parties, Nicholsville and Lehigh, into um, a mediation presided over by a mutually agreed upon mediator. And uh, also, I just wanted to remind everyone that that mediation letter has been signed by not only by the council, which is very important, but also by over 100, I believe, at this point, community members or organizations, depending on who the entities are. Uh, and we are trying to continue to have those discussions uh, you know, privately with uh, Nicholsville and Lehigh uh, folks so that we can bring this to fruition. And I really, really hope that we will be able to do it in the near future. And with that said, we also want to acknowledge that uh, we welcome your public comment if it's on this topic or any topic, um, and we will make sure to get to that before the end of the meeting. Thank you, Council Members Want, and welcome Co-Chair Bagshaw. Thank you for being here. Um, so, Farida, if we could, let's read into the agenda item number one. Agenda item number one, Human Services Department's Homelessness Performance Metrics for Briefing and Discussion. Thank you so much. And joining us at the table is uh, Council Central Staff Jeff Sims. Thank you for being here. In the audience, we have Tess Colby from the Mayor's Office and Jason Johnson, who are here if we have questions, but I understand won't be joining us at the table for this topic. Um, so thank you, uh, Jeff, for being here. Uh, if we could get the presentation put up on the screen. Uh, this is an issue that has come to us for the last uh, four, well, I would say actually six to eight months. We've been talking about the need to have a robust data set that we can all look to to see how we're doing in terms of um, sheltering those who are currently experiencing homelessness, uh, preventing those from experiencing more homelessness, um, helping to divert individuals from uh, falling out of their house situation and into the streets, and to really show what we're doing with uh, our investment in some of our most valuable partners being those human service providers on the ground. 
Uh, we have an opportunity, I think, to highlight some of the work that we've done in a way that um, expresses to our public the most important role that we have as public servants is to make sure that the public dollar is being put to the best public use and to build trust and to be transparent in how we're investing those public dollars. Um, since basically December, and I would say maybe November during the budget deliberations, we've been wanting to showcase to the public where these dollars have gone and to show constituents that we're making progress. We've seen some of the rates decline in terms of the number of people experiencing homelessness outside, at least according to the point in time count, which we also know is an undercount. We've seen um, in, in incredibly important statistics to remember uh, in terms of how many shelter beds we have open a night presented at various points. I know we did this during the budget deliberation process earlier this year and more recently via email. I've been inquiring about how many enhanced shelter beds we have open a night on average. The latest statistic that we saw was five enhanced shelter beds and one tiny house village bed open on average a night in the, in the city. When we have a regional crisis that has about 5,500 people who are sleeping outside unsheltered and only five or six enhanced shelter beds open a night, it helps us underscore the urgency of creating affordable housing now and opening additional enhanced shelter beds. There's a lot of reasons people don't want to go to mat on the floor um, shelters. We've heard time and time again to line up at six in the morning and, and or to leave at six in the morning and then have to line up at 6 p.m. doesn't create a sense of stability. We've heard time and time again that the more enhanced shelter beds are open, the more families can stay together, people can be with pets, items can be put into lockers, people can have showers, and really importantly, access to case management, health counseling, and true uh, uh, holistic services. That's the importance of this type of data. When we see where the gaps are, we can help fill those gaps. When we know what we've been doing well, we can help direct funding to what's been uh, successful in our city. And we really appreciate the conversation that we've had with a number of the providers and community. I would say a lot of people who have said to us, yes, we're reporting time and time again on what's, what we were at, being asked to report on to the city, but sometimes we're not being asked to report on some of the things that we know work really well, specifically around diversion. There's a lot of people who've said we would love to provide more statistics on who we're helping to prevent from becoming homeless and also they would love to help us have metrics and indicators on why it's so important to keep your same case manager. We've heard from direct service providers that without the ability to have a case manager on site or the same case manager, uh, we end up losing people into the system or into cycling back into homelessness and we're not able to provide them with the robust services. So this type of data is important. We've seen this from previous administrations like even uh, Governor Locke's administration when they did the Blue Ribbon Commission and every department had a set of metrics that they reported on, I believe, monthly. Here we are. Um, we've been asking for eight months for a similar set of metrics and I know, Jeff, you're going to walk us through what we currently have in terms of metrics that are being reported. Reported from the all home dash, uh, dashboard provided by the providers to HSD and the metrics, this is just a few of them, suggested by provider organizations themselves. Uh, so I really look forward to hearing more about, and Jeff, I know you're for, sort of filling in for central staff, but uh, my intent is to make sure that we're working in coordination with the mayor's office to get this set of robust metrics. I'm looking at an email that is dated April 20th from the um, executive's office where there was an acknowledgement that we are working to, I think, on a joint strategy to make sure that there is a dashboard, a, a shared interest in making sure that a dashboard is created and a commitment here in writing that we would have updates in May and June. Uh, we are now mid-July and we don't have this folks from the executive's office sitting at the table. So what I'm hoping with our council um, co-chairs here is that we can continue to work on getting this item um, put in front of us. And we know that there is work being done done by each department to come up with a set of metrics um, that would not just specifically ho focus on homelessness, but that is something that would be used for various departments. That's a good first start. So we look forward to hearing more about how those specific metrics as they relate to services to homelessness will be provided to the, um, not just the council, but to the general public and um, I would say the media so that we have a better understanding of where we're doing well, what issues we can report on how we're incorporating the provider feedback in 
terms of new metrics that would come forward. And um, Jeff, I will turn it over to you uh, to walk us through what we currently know, what we currently have in hand as it relates to a potential dashboard for performance data on how we're serving those who are homeless and potentially those who we're preventing from becoming homeless, um, and then open it up to my colleagues for questions. Try again. Is that working now? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, for the record, Jeff Sims from Council Central Staff. Uh, Council member, as you noted, the last time that this committee discussed this topic was at our April 22nd meeting. And at that time, and also in conversations over email and with the executive, uh, we were looking, uh, we learned about efforts underway both by the mayor's office and HSD to put together dashboards and ways of visualizing and better communicating to the public the progress being made with our investments on homelessness and how they're continually being improved. Since that time, uh, or let me first highlight that during that meeting, there was also a panel of providers that provided input on additional metrics on top of what HSD is currently putting together and measures as part of their contracts that highlighted areas that the providers would like to see also measured or also incorporated into their contracts as measures that they should be having held accountable to. The handout that you have on screen right now, if you look at the green box where it says metrics suggested by providers, uh, that is a high level summary of what some of those are. And I'll walk through each of these boxes in a moment. Also, since the council meeting, since the meeting of this select committee, All Home, which is the continuum of care for King County and Seattle, uh, has since up released its point in time count and simultaneously updated its online dashboards, uh, which is an area that it, um, is able then to pull, not quite in real time, but very current data then on what is uh, metrics about our services and the population experiencing homelessness. That was updated, as I said, since this committee last had discussed this topic, and that is the orange box that you see on your handout and then the data points that they have now. And then uh, we also have been receiving and, and uh, in the April 9th meeting of the Human Services Equitable Development and Renters' Rights Committee was the last time that we had presented the blue box. Those are metrics that HSD regularly provides to the council. Those metrics are manually pulled. They didn't have an automated system making a presentation of those, those data points automatic or something that could be posted online in real time. Uh, but those are metrics that we regularly receive. So quickly to go through those, you can see that the online dashboard that All Home currently has uh, has four main areas. First, it looks at the population of households that are, being, that are experiencing homelessness and being served. Uh, and there's a variety of ways that that's broken down, sometimes by population, like veterans or youth or families, but also looking at race and ethnicity and some other metrics. The second area they largely look at is who they're serving, again with demographic breakdowns, but also um, they have a graphic that looks at where people are coming from, whether it was a recent stay in a shelter, if they had recently been experiencing homelessness, it's their first time, and where they exit to. So if it was permanent housing, or we lost track of them, or they exited back into homelessness. The third main category, as I would put it, of what is presented by All Home is individual performance. So if you went to the, the All Home website, you could actually go to a, a screen that has every single one of our, for example, shelter providers. You could hover over that box and you'd see a variety of metrics posted for that individual provider according to the type of intervention it is. And that's what's listed there is um, the type of metrics that are reported for each provider. Finally, they've added or, um, or well, online that they have uh, metrics that are specific to rapid rehousing. When you go to their page that looks exactly at rapid rehousing, there's certain metrics that are unique to that intervention that we're really focused on that they also have online and maintain. As I mentioned, the blue box, which I know this council is very familiar with because they get presented on a regular basis, are presentations that HSD regularly comes and provides to us, and it's data that's provided. That includes our exits to permanent housing by program type, so permanent supportive housing, or, well, that would, um, sorry, that'd be a bad example, um, uh, enhanced shelters or uh, uh, our outreach providers making references to a shelter, things like that. The number of households that are served, uh, where those individuals go to, and then also some race and ethnicity goals. The last data that we had received on that looked at the totality of 2018, and I've, um, I know there's some discussions to get the first quarter or second quarter updates from HSD for 2019. 
And then, as I mentioned, there were a variety of places that providers, when we last met, uh, highlighted additional metrics that they would suggest we include, such as considering the vulnerability of clients that are served, perhaps not as a public-facing dashboard, but at least looking at the type of uh, performance that they're required to meet. So if you have a program that's really serving the hardest to serve, uh, recognizing that. Looking at the type of data, the services that a person experiencing homelessness asks for and how often we are responding to that. Uh, focusing on mental health and substance abuse services, which we know are very important um, in responding to the needs of this population. Uh, a variety of metrics, uh, I only put two in the boxes here, but on progress towards housing. So um, not just uh, placement in a permanent housing, but also perhaps retention in a substance abuse treatment program or returning to family reunification, something like that. And then of course, some way of accounting for when there are limited number of beds that have, um, in shelters, enhanced shelters and tiny house villages that might have impacted the ability to place someone into an intervention like that. Uh, so that's a high-level overview, and I'll uh, defer to the council for any questions or, or clarifications you might have. Thank you. Council Member Backshaw. Thank you. Council Jeff, Member, thank, co Chair Backshaw. Thank you uh, for your good work on this. Thank you to our Human Services Department. I know this has been something you've been working on, and to our police who are helping us as well. I want to recognize something that we, ha we have underway, and that is our Health One project, which is our low acuity work with. Um, our uh, first responders. And one of the things that I've heard from them multiple times is that as we're working with our crisis connections, that they need extra beds, they need places where they can refer folks, whether that's you know alternatives to Harborview. So whether it is a more 24 seven shelter, whether it's the tiny homes or whether it's a mental health bed, this needs to be coordinated. So I just wanna underscore as we're doing this um, and working on the performance data on what is happening, that we also in real time need to make sure that we've got spaces for people and for our first responders to take those people other than Harborview Hospital. So this is looking both to the past and looking to the future. And I just hope that we can recognize how important this is. Thank you. Other comments from council colleagues? Council Member Herbal. Thank you. Um, it would help me to understand um, the purpose of um, our efforts to collectively um, have a discussion around performance data um, on homelessness. Um, I appreciate knowing that there have been some suggestions by providers, but what is the, what is the path forward to, um, to update the performance data on homelessness? When this committee last met and also in subsequent email conversations, we were told that there were two simultaneous pathways going on. One was uh, work with the Mayor's Innovation Advisory Council to find a way to take data that is um, in HMIS that we don't have a good automated way to pull that data out and put it into something that can be visualized and displayed. And um, then also uh, highlighted at that time was the, were the updates that All Home would be making to its dashboard. Both of those uh, with the ultimate goal of making it transparent to the public, what work our programs are doing, the places that programs are succeeding and are showing their, their effectiveness and continuing to improve. And um, then also conveying the, the scale of the problem and the scale of the solutions that we're implementing. Um, but these are, these are changes for All Home to make to its dashboard, is that correct? What was presented at the time were discussions actually that were being undertaken by the executive, so HSD or the mayor's office, uh, working with a group of advisors that can help to assist with some of those technical uh, back of the house, so to speak, uh, innovations. So you could take what is currently a little more difficult to access, our HMIS data system that we actually have to manually pull a lot of that data for, for example, the, the information that's in the blue box has to be manually pulled and compiled and verified, um, and then uh, put it into some kind of an automated online, easier to maintain format. And that's the work that is underway that uh, I believe it um, continues and has been delayed at this point. Follow up? Um, so I think the ability to um, update this, uh, the information that is uh, provided to council that the public sees, um, that's a laudable exercise and it's, and it's necessary to improve transparency. But I think as it relates specifically to um, performance-based contracting, um, we, ha we also have a conversation that we need to have about 
what outcomes we want uh, agencies to report on because there's a lot of concern that they're um, that the focus on um, exits to permanent housing don't consider a few things like for instance multiple organizations um, will um, have an interaction with a client um, on that that individual's road to stability um, and as I understand it only the last organization who touches that client actually gets the um, it's the credit, if you will, uh, for the outcome. So that that's a concern. There's a concern also that um, the the um, the approach that we're that we're focusing only. And I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't um, have as an outcome access to housing. But if if we um, uh, are not looking at the fact that the Bar Poppy report recommended that we should be serving, um, we should be focusing our efforts on serving the most difficult to house. Um, that there may be a uh, inadvertent, perverse incentive uh, on the part of providers to um, assist the easiest to house in order for those outcomes. And so we also need outcomes designed um, to incentivize the behavior um, or, or the, not the behavior, the outcomes for organizations serving um, our highest priority populations, which are those populations that are hardest to serve. Absolutely. And I do want to highlight that uh, Shortly, we're going to have a presentation updating on the regional governance discussions. And part of that conversation, uh, Tess Colby from the mayor's office will be talking about the regional action plan. And my understanding of that regional action plan is in many of the what you just highlighted will be discussed. So a specific uh, goal would be outlined with specific metrics behind it and how we get to those places. And it um, might not necessarily say placement and permanent housing for a program that has a different goal that contributes to that path to permanent housing for an individual. Thank you. Um, Council Member Sawant and then Council Member uh, Gonzalez. Thank you. Thank you, Co-Chair. Uh, so, I mean, one point I had was uh, somewhat in line with what Council Member Herbold was saying, that the metrics, uh, I guess one can say all metrics are not made equal in the sense that if, if somebody, if, if, if our programs are working in such a way that there are individuals who are experiencing either chronic homelessness or experiencing repeated bouts of homelessness because the system is failing <laughs> them in, in specific ways, then that those, need, those metrics are more complex. They are not simply, did you help somebody get into permanent housing? And I agree with the concern that on the, uh, the, the people least served are not being caught in our study of metrics. Along similar lines, though, uh, one concern I've had, and I've, you know, I've, I've talked about it before, is that the, that the Human Services Department really does not present any re meaningful metrics related to the sweeps. And I've asked them multiple times about, um, you know, how are you measuring your work on exits to permanent housing? And the answer we've often heard in council is, that, well, that's, uh, you, I mean, they don't call it sweeps. We, I call it sweeps because I think they are sweeps. But the point being that the work of the navigation team cannot be, uh, you know, it, those metrics don't apply because we don't actually turn them towards permanent housing. We turn them towards other options. Fair enough. But the point I think that should not be lost is if this is something that the city is spending millions of dollars on, then we do need a way of measuring its effectiveness. Because so far, all we know is that it's actually not working. And so if there's a way, when as we look at performance data, which I really think it's a, it's a good idea and sort of have to have this sort of um, you know, overview of where the data are coming from, who's proposing the metrics, and so on, I think uh, as long as the sweeps continue, we do need to insist on some meaningful metrics so that those dollars that are used in it are actually in service of the people who need them. Great point. Um, I will also highlight that uh, one of our agenda items today is to discuss the expansion of the navigation team. Uh, we recently had at the a June meeting of the uh, uh, Civil Rights, Ec Utilities, uh, Equitable Development, and Arts Committee, uh, a presentation on the latest metrics related to the navigation team. Uh, you're, you're right that the performance, uh, the metrics that are reported on there differ from all of our other uh, 
programs. There's not a discussion of placement into permanent housing. Uh, they do report on referrals to shelter. Um, but, but we will be discussing the navigation team uh, later at this committee meeting, as well as the additional FTEs that have been hired to support that team. Yeah, just a quick follow-up. Thank you, Co-Chair Mosqueda. I, yeah, I, I appreciate that the, the, they will be there. My concern is, at least when I saw the, what they had submitted to the committee, is the same presentation that they had submitted in a previous select committee. And I, and I feel like they're not answering the questions the council has asked them. So something to be followed up on. Thank you. Thank you, Co-Chair. Um, Councilmember Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Chair. So um, really quickly, I just, I, I'm just i not sure I heard you, Jeff, say this, but I, but, so I want to go back and I apologize if I'm making you repeat yourself, but I want to make sure that I understand the chart and, um, and what we're trying to communicate with this chart. So in the red box is what um, All Home King County system does to publicly share um, information about the work that the county has been doing in the space of um, addressing the experience of homelessness. Is that accurate? That'd be correct. It would include Seattle then because uh, as our continuum of care, we would have all of our Seattle investments that are uh, then entering data into mm -hmm. HMIS mm -hmm. would also be part of what All Home is capturing. Right, because the city of Seattle is a member of the All Home King County effort. Yeah. Um, but but that that this online dashboard that is reflected on this chart within the red um, box, and I apologize to all our friends who might be colorblind and can't see red, but it's the box that says All Homes Online Dashboard. The um, I just want to make sure that that system and that uh, dashboard production is owned by King County, not by HSD or the City of Seattle. That's correct. Okay. So then when we move to the right side of this page, we see the blue chart on top, which is titled data provided to council by HSD. And then we have the green box that says metrics suggested by providers. As it relates to the, the blue box, um, what I'm understanding is that this is data that HSD provides to the city council, but doesn't necessarily uh, present it in the form of a dashboard similar to what we see on All Homes' website or their materials. That's also correct. These are presentations that are, uh, the data is pulled manually and put together as a presentation for a the council or the uh, committee of the council, uh, and, and those are the metrics that are in that. It is not put online. It is not uh, updated in real time. There's no web page that you can land on and locate that. So... So we, as policymakers sitting up here in our staff, um, including Council Central staff, get sort of this rich data, but it's up to us to figure out how to translate it, and it's up to us to figure out how to or if we communicate it in a particular way to um, the general public and taxpayers. Is that accurate? Yes, it would be. There's uh, The presentations are in committee, so there is a presentation by HSD, but uh, yeah, just receiving the data and the updates, there's not any way. It's, uh, it would be up to the council to oh. communicate that further. Okay, and then the stuff in the green box, metrics suggested by providers, is that, is this, are the various data points or suggestions that are listed in that box in the lower right-hand corner, is that captured in the data and reported in any way um, in the data that we see listed either in All Homes online dashboard box or in the data provided to council by HSD box? Generally, speak, generally speaking, I would say no. The, um, those are metrics that were suggested by providers to be either additive or as a replacement for some metrics. Um, and that's the kind of the purpose of what I put together here is to highlight some of the areas uh, where there's not overlap for the council members. Okay, so the stuff in the, in the green, the metrics suggested by providers, those are literally just suggestions. We are not capturing that information anywhere currently, either us or all home. Um, not, that's not 100% true. For example, the vulnerability score of the client served would be captured. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not aware of any location where that's currently presented or made public. Okay. Um, 
data on services requested, there are, you could say that there's some places where we capture, for example, in um, what's sent to the council regarding the navigation team on a quarterly basis does talk about types of services requested and, um, and engaging with clients and the kind of outreach that they will accept. Uh, but generally speaking, these are metrics that are not being captured for all programs system-wide or presented in a uniform and consistent way to the public. That's very helpful. So, um, and I think that um, what I'm what I was struggling with is trying to figure out what we were comparing because I wanted to make sure that we were comparing apples to apples. Um, so it sounds like what this this chart is is intended to communicate is that um, it appears that all home King County has a more transparent, more consistent, standardized way of publicly sharing. Um, uh, data related to performance of investments that the county has made in the space of um, homelessness as opposed to the city who has um, some of those components but not all of those components and we appear to be reporting inconsistently. Uh, I would say that's correct. The uh, county who owns our, our management mm -hmm. of the HMIS data system, so in many ways they are the possessors of the database and HSD collaborates with the county to get that data. Okay, and that leads me to the last um, line of questioning or points I wanted to make, which which it's helpful for me to get a better understanding and framing of what what we're what we're seeing and evaluating in this um, single page uh, presentation. Um, and that sort of helps frame for me some of the comments that Council Member Herbold was making um, a few moments ago. And I, th I, th I think that her points are valid in terms of one of the purposes or a purpose of the work that we're trying to do here is, um, is not just counting the widgets, um, but really getting a clear understanding of why we are creating performance measurements um, and, and that doing the exercise of creating performance measurements is critical to accurately reflect uh, our expected outcomes that are evidence-based and aligned with strategies that we have supported in the past that are shown to end the experience of homelessness for individuals. And I think that's what I was hearing Council Member Herbal articulate is that you, you, there are lots of different purposes that we can use data for, and there's a lot of different purposes that we can come up with performance data and metrics for, but one of those things has to always be centered in how are we developing performance measurements that will, again, accurately reflect our expectations of outcomes um, that are evidence-based and aligned with strategies that we know will help to end somebody's experience um, with homelessness or, and make it a short experience to the extent that it is an experience. And I agree with that, but I also agree that um, the additional purpose to that, which I think is exemplified by this chart, is that I have been, and I think members on this council have been, and certainly the public has been very frustrated with what I would consider to be inaccurate reporting by the executive and HSD of what we've already done in the space of investments of, um, of, uh, human, of homelessness services. And so we have had, mo most recently in the last two years, multiple examples that we can point to that either overstate, understate, um, what our outcomes have actually been in the space of our investments of homelessness. And so I see this as also an attempt to really um, get on the same page as it relates to what um, data is being reported out to the general public. So it's, it's not a moving away completely from the widget construct, but it's making sure that if we are going to continue to count widgets, that that is being done in a consistent, standardized way so that we can trust and have confidence in the data and the information that is being provided to us in the blue box when we do see it so that we have a high level of confidence as policymakers that that information is accurate because we have all had the experience up on this dais of it not being accurate and the ripple waves and the lack and the, and the mistrust that engenders in the work that the city is doing in this space has been incredibly detrimental to our ongoing efforts to be serious about addressing this crisis around homelessness. Um, and so 
I just want to make sure that my understanding of sort of how I've thread the needle there on that last point is um, is an accurate intent of the co-chairs and the council and, and is supported by council central staff's analysis of um, what we see on this chart. Thank you, council member Gonzalez. I want to um, underscore my appreciation for your comments and all the council colleagues who've spoken on this. This is precisely why we've been asking for eight months for a dashboard to be provided to this council. We have seen robust data presented in multiple forms uh, throughout the budget process and I would argue throughout last spring and summer as well as we talked about the need for additional investments and making sure that those investments were going to the evidence-based proven practices that we know to be successful because they've been generated and led by our community partners. Um, I want to thank you for articulating that uh, point again and underscoring, I think, the full council's interest in this concept of a dashboard. I'm also going to hand out some of the early preliminary thinking that we have shared with the executive that summarizes some of these points in a slightly different way. Um, what you can see here is information that we know to be already available, such as exits to permanent housing, length of stay in shelters, potential returns to homelessness, entries from homelessness, utilization rates. Um, but then we also talk about the ways in which we can better capture some of the uh, ways in which we're serving those who are experiencing homelessness. Looking at the number of enhanced shelter beds open per night on average is something that I brought up repeatedly versus the number of mats on the floor that are open on an average night. The number of people uh, who've been moved from unsanctioned encampments is really important for us to understand and where they've been moved to. Every time we hear about a sweep or we hear about uh, people being moved out of unsanctioned encampments, the biggest question I have is how many of those people got access to enhanced shelter because they're more likely to stay in enhanced shelter than if we were offering them mats on the ground. Um, other items that we've talked about are in those last two categories. These come directly from the human service providers. You know, for example, um, we talk a lot about the low acuity visits, how many folks are getting, uh, needing access to mental health treatment and maybe even just wound treatment. It'd be interesting to see if we can capture that information. Again, I mentioned at the very beginning, stays on med uh, the ability to stay on your medical uh, care or to stay with your case managers came directly from the, some of the providers. The ability for kids to stay in the same school to create a consistent consistency uh, has been critical and been raised by some of the providers as well. These are just some examples, but I think what you've heard from us, and I'm going to look at our friends from the executive's office, what you're hearing from the whole council is a desire to see this robust dashboard provided so that we're not in the impossible position of trying to cobble together the very important data points that we do see from the various reports that have come forward, either the reports during budget, the reports from all home, the reports on the quarterly updates um, from the navigation team. Um, um, and just general HSD data uh, are critical for us to have in hand and ideally in one place. And the last thing I'll say on this is as we look to create a regional governance structure for serving those who are experiencing homelessness and preventing people from falling into homelessness, this type of baseline data is really important. We will have a conversation later um, about what that regional structure looks like, but I think it's imperative for us as policymakers, those who have um, the responsibility of holding the purse strings for at least a portion, a large portion of what will come forward, to know where we're at and then to be able to measure where we've gone and where we need to continue to invest in. This is about good governance and transparency and being, um, I think, fiscally wise with our dollars as we center those who've experienced homelessness in how we're evaluating our successes and not to be punitive to any of the providers, but to really lift up the work that the providers have done so we're making sure that the investment goes to the right places. I know we have two other items on our agenda. Seeing no other comments on this issue. I'm going to go ahead and say thank you, Jeff, for presenting us with that um, spreadsheet. I think the message has been heard loud and clear that we would like to continue to work on a robust set of data and metrics uh, so that we can evaluate how we're doing in one place, especially as we move forward with our regional governance effort. Um, and Faride, thank you so much uh, for reading into the agenda item number two. Agenda item number two, navigation team expansion update for briefing and discussion. And could we please be joined at the table by David Mo Dep Deputy Mayor David Mosley, uh, Michelle Finnegan, Department of Parks and Rec, Sina um, Ebener, Ebener from the Seattle Police Department, Tess Colby from the Mayor's Office, Jason Johnson from HSD, Jeff Sims from Central Staff. Thanks for hanging out here with us still. 
Um, council colleagues, first I want to acknowledge Councilmember O'Brien came in very early and I didn't get a chance to note you for the record. Thank you for being here as well. Um, this is uh, an item that has two attachments. There's background on the expansion of the navigation team. Memo provided by central staff, Jeff Sims. Thank you, Jeff, for providing that memo for us. And the Seattle Human Services Department navigation team capacity increase presentation dated June 2019 by HSD. Um, I don't think we're going to go through all of the details of the PowerPoint presentation again, but I do think that folks were going to highlight some key components, if I'm not um, mistaken. Um, and uh, before we get into public, or before we get into the meat of this discussion, let's just do introductions real quick. Tess, if you want to lead us off, and then I have some opening comments. Uh, Tess Colby, Mayor's Office. Jeff Sims, Council Central Staff. David Mosley, Mayor's Office. Jason Johnson, Human Services Department. Cena Abinger, SPD Navigation Team. Michelle Finnegan, Seattle Parks and Recreation. Great. Um, so why don't we go ahead and let you jump into your presentation and I'll save some comments for later. I know we're on a short timeline today and really want to get through all of these items. Deputy Mayor Mosley, are you kicking us off here? Sure, be happy to uh, offer some initial uh, comments. We're very pleased to be here today to discuss the nav navigation team's work and the capacity increase that we've uh, uh, laid out this year. Uh, the team, of course, has reported previously to the, to the committee, and this is an opportunity to discuss the team's ongoing work to the full committee, and we thank you for inviting us to do that. Uh, it is no understatement to say that the navigation team saves lives. The people who make up the navigation team come to work every day to do some of the hardest things the city asks city staff to do. They approach the work with compassion, patience, and care for the people they are trying to help. I've seen this personally as I've gone out with the navigation team and as I've gone to uh, uh, villages and, and shelters. I guess the most stark example of that was during the snowstorm when the navigation teams literally work 24 hours a day to bring people in to temporary shelters that we set up and the feedback we got from some of the people who were brought in by the navigation team to those temporary shelters is they didn't know if they would have made it. And so the team saves lives. Uh, since Mayor Durkin took office, she has made investments that allow the team to add critically needed staff and resources, uh, which we will be previewing, reviewing with you today. Uh, many departments, including the Human Services Department, uh, Public Utilities, Park and Recreation, Police Department, contribute to this body of work. Today's presentation highlights these increased efforts, which work in concert to both the unsheltered and the sheltered community. I'd like to now call on Jason Johnson to provide the background information. Great, thank you. Uh, so the navigation team's mission uh, is twofold, outreach, connecting people to services and shelter, and removing encampments that pose public health and safety risk. The team has made thousands of contacts out, and out in the field, building up a list that helps us match people to resources and shelter. Hundreds of encampments have been removed from public property, addressing very real public health and safety concerns. Uh, I want to acknowledge that many of the members of the navigation team are in the chamber today. Uh, I just want to personally thank uh, that team for their efforts, for getting out uh, every day and engaging in a way that is not just compassionate, but is resource-minded uh, and helps make those connections for folks that are living outdoors. I really appreciate their work and honor their work, and thank you for being here today. When the team started in 2017, it was about 22 people. Uh, those 22 individuals uh, represented multiple departments as well as Evergreen Treatment Services. They were field coordinators, police officers, operation managers, uh, contracted outreach workers. In uh, 2018, thanks to investments made by the mayor and council, the team added support functions and increased capacity through data analysis, uh, administrative support, additional field coordinators, and in 2019, the addition of system navigators, which I'll discuss a little in, in, in more detail a little later. 
So this is uh, Q1 data. We have presented this information at a previous committee, uh, but I think it's important to highlight uh, what the overall navigation team's uh, data looks like. Um, we'll have data two uh, coming soon and expect to present that back to council um, in the coming weeks or months. Um, the individuals engaged are unique people the team members talk to and interact with. Uh, contacts are a number of conversations that have occurred. Uh, think of that as the volume of work that's being ma made in the field. Individual people can be contacted multiple times or just once. Referrals to shelter are duplicated. Uh, these referrals to shelter represent 203 unique individuals. Uh, the team has been focused on obstruction or hazard removals in quarter one to ensure that sidewalks and public spaces are safe and open to everyone. 72-hour cleanups have been focused toward larger, more complex removals like the Trolls Knoll. Uh, referral to shelter information. Uh, we've included a breakdown of shelter referrals in, in Q1 report, and we'll do so again in Q2. Uh, enhanced shelter and tiny house villages remain the most attractive shelter resource for people living unsheltered. Uh, and there are, on average, 17 beds available to the navigation team every day. I'm sorry. Um, can you clarify that number? The last time we checked in on this, and I double checked in on that um, two weeks ago, was that for last month's data, there was five enhanced shelter beds open and one tiny house village bed open on night in, per average. Where are we now getting the 17 number? And again, this is part of our desire to make sure that we're reporting consistently. Um, the last time I had the chance, the opportunity to chair this committee, I asked that question as well. And at the time at the table, the number was given 40. And then we learned in retrospect that it was actually that six number. So where is 17 coming from at this point? 17 is the total, uh, is the average of beds available on any given day when the navigation team is deployed. Oh, okay. I, think I misunderstood you. Cause, so it's not enhanced shelter beds, it's total beds. Not necessarily. Okay, thank you for that clarification. That's very helpful. All right, with uh, new investments, the navigation team was able to increase its capacity to further its mission. Uh, system navigators are new to this body of work. Uh, these are in-house outreach workers, and they are available at all of the cleanups, uh, which include the hazard and obstruction work, uh, and they are available to offer services to uh, uh, individuals living outdoors. They're also available uh, on weekends to connect with people and also are helping uh, Seattle P Public Utility with their RV work. Uh, this is an overall increase in the team's outreach capacity and frees up reach uh, from Evergreen Treatment Services to conduct outreach in advance at more locations. Uh, we've also added uh, more field coordinators, which allows the team uh, to take on more specific concerns such as removals and litter pickups, which help make Seattle cleaner and safer while leaving encampments in place. There is uh, also improved coordination with the Seattle Police Department. Uh, this means when community police teams and bike patrol uh, offers come across uh, someone who's in need of help, there's more overlap with the navigation team. This includes connecting uh, people with services, storage of belongings, referrals to shelter, and cleaning up obstructions. I'll also just state that weekend coverage is now possible uh, due to this expansion. Uh, thanks to all of these working efforts working in concert together, the team can make referrals to shelters on weekends, uh, which is a new element to the outreach team. Uh, the team can also uh, clean up garbage and remove encampments on weekend. So this is a uh, expansion over the five day uh, weekday services that were in place before. Uh Thank you, uh, Interim Director. Um, Council Member Herbold has a quick question on the last slide, I believe. Um, well, it's the last slide in conjunction with the one previous to it. Um, the data slide on the uh, first quarter uh, 2019 report. So uh, I just want to highlight th that for um, referrals um, and contacts, um, this first quarter 2019 uh, report shows um, 
significantly fewer uh, referrals to shelter. We have uh, 222 referrals to shelter for the first quarter 2019, whereas um, the uh, um, first part of, uh, let's see, last year, um, we're looking at 432 referrals to shelter. Um, I'm sorry, no, that's a comparison of this last quarter to the previous quarter, and that's actually half the number of referrals to shelter from the first part of last year. Similarly, numbers of contacts. Um, we have 244 contacts um, for August 2018 to March 2019. Um, it was um, about 1,800 contacts. Now it's uh, 1,564 contacts. And similarly, it's less than half the number reported quarterly in 2018, which was more about 3,500 um, contacts per quarter. Um, similarly, the um, as we mentioned earlier, the number of removals who actually um, received 72 hours notice and that ongoing engagement of outreach has decreased. And I don't know if there's a relationship there um, between the, um, the increase in um, obstruction uh, removals that don't require outreach um, and this pretty significant reduction in uh, numbers of contacts and referrals. It has been said, we, ha we had a briefing on these numbers in, in my committee. Um, folks pointed to the fact that this is the period of time when the storm occurred, um, but from my understanding of what was happening during this storm, there was more engagement um, and um, you know people were working 24 seven, um, uh, on, on trying to reach people during that time and trying to make referrals to shelter. Um, so I am, I am concerned that um, despite the fact that we have um, uh, consistently responded to the mayor's request to expand the navigation team, the um, numbers of people who are being engaged in the referrals to shelter seem to be um, shrinking in size. Mm -hmm. Comments? Yeah, I want to uh, maybe go to the next slide uh, where we talk about uh, the expansion effort and the numbers for the month of June. Um, so th you'll see that uh, the uh, staff and improvements have been uh, added since fall of last year, but with the addition of the system navigators, this na uh, navigation team is operating at a higher capacity across the board. Um, so I'll specifically uh, point to the data that's on screen. Uh, you'll see that uh, garbage and waste de debris is up roughly 30 tons when compared to monthly average. Uh, site inspections used to do 25 a month on average. In June, there were 165 that were conducted. Uh, the 72-hour removals uh, doubled in June when compared to monthly averages. Uh, obstructions and hazards are up. Uh, litter pickups are up as well, with the team doing more litter pickups in June than the rest of the year combined, uh, reducing hazards in encampments and in surrounding community. So I think this, uh, you know, we've only had the expansion uh, uh, in place for uh, one month. Uh, during the month of June, I want to come back and show, you know, full Q2 uh, data, uh, but I think that what we're seeing in June with the full team operating uh, the way we, we intend, we're seeing uh, a much uh, larger increase in, in production uh, and keeping uh, spaces clean, but also in being able to engage with folks. Um, Interim Director Johnson, uh, thank you for this presentation. I want to go back to the question that Councilmember Herbold asked, though, and this is, again, precisely why I think a dashboard that looks month to month is important. Thank you for the indicators you've included on this last slide. But when we say navigation team, the intent is to navigate them somewhere, mm -hmm. ideally into enhanced shelter. And what we don't have in this sheet here, what we don't have in this table is where they've been navigated to. I see the bullet points above that says that there's 20 total referrals to shelter. Again, the type of shelter that we're talking about, whether that's enhanced or not on the floor, is important to know. And the 22% referral rate is an indicator, but we don't have anything to compare it to. When we look at the 222 referrals to shelter that Councilmember Herbold um, 
commented back on for the quarter one 2019 report, that's an indicator, but then again, there's nothing to compare that to. So ideally what we would have in this chart, and it, I believe based on the other data you've provided, um, it would be possible to pull, but it would be helpful to see what those numbers look like month after month, where those individuals have been referred to, whether it's men on the ground or enhanced shelter, and how those numbers compare month over month. Um, I anecdotally have heard the same thing that Deputy Mayor Mosley commented on, which is we saw an increase in the number of people referred to shelters. Ideally, it'd be helpful to know again what type of shelters, but you would expect to see that increase in the month, I believe, of February. That helps us understand where we're serving folks, how we're serving them, and where they're being navigated to. So in this navigation team operation, can you comment on where people are being navigated to, and specifically to the question that Councilmember Herbold asked, are we seeing a decrease in the type of navigation to shelters that are coming from referrals from the navigation team? Councilmember Herbold, did I capture your question correctly? Yeah, so uh, we met just last week and uh, to look at the data, and it seems like most of the engagements, uh, folks are complying, uh, meaning they are, are, are moving themselves and their belongings out of the right-of-way uh, and are not um, necessarily engaging on uh, in a, a, a services conversation uh, with the, the, the nav system navigators. So for the most part, when um, uh, the navigation team is called to an obstruction or a hazard, uh, most of the folks are complying uh, right then and there and are not engaging in a discussion um, ab about services. That said, we're uh, prepared to have those engagements. We want to enter into that dialogue and um, the navigation team is prepared to uh, offer a, a, a wide array of services, um, but not everyone is, is interested in having that discussion. Colleagues? I'm just concerned that we've hired system navigators and that navigation isn't, isn't occurring. Um, in those in those particular types of obstruction removals um, and and that these are folks that we have focused to help people in those instances and because of the nature of that um, that interaction it's not happening agreed this is the point in time where we have the chance to interact with folks we I think anticipated that the entire team would be involved in those conversations I know councilmember Swant and councilmember Gonzalez I believe we're reaching for their microphones if anybody else. Um, and then perhaps you can comment on that. Just very quickly, yeah, just to uh, reiterate the points that were already made by other council members that uh, we're really not seeing the kind of data we need to see. And also, you, uh, it's, not, it's simply not good enough to say that the city is going to spend millions of dollars on a program that nobody can quantify the results of and that the best you can say, at, at least as far as what you're saying right now, is that the people, the homeless community members, complied with the navigation team's instructions to not uh, be in the obstruction areas, which you know credit to them, uh, even even though they're facing such a brutal experience, they are they are they are you know participating in that uh, requirement, but. That's not what the claim of the navigation team is. I mean, the, so much money is being spent on the navigation team not to get human beings away from uh, business obstructions or other obstructions. It's the claim is being made that it's helping people. And I don't, uh, with all due respect, Deputy Mayor Mosley, I don't think you can use what the navigation team did during the snowstorms, which is absolutely uh, critical, uh, you know, bringing people into shelter during that time. But I, I don't think you can... Uh, use that to then make generalized claims about the effectiveness of the navigation team. It's about what is happening overall year after year. And it's, it's just, you know, I'm, I've reached a point where there's presentation after presentation in both my committee and in the select committee and also uh, in Councilmember Herbold's committee. I've been at all these committees and we're not, we're simply not seeing the results, and I just feel like numbers are being spun di different ways, and uh, and I, I and I'm not alone. I see a lot of people nodding here. We've had a lot of feedback from constituents through letters and phone calls that uh, they just don't see what the navigation team is accomplishing. 
I'm going to ask Councilmember Gonzalez to make her comment, and then I believe um, it would be helpful to hear a response uh, to all three of those comments. Councilmember Gonzalez. Sure. I actually don't have a comment. I have some questions. So if you, if you want them to answer okay. these questions first, I'm hap I, I will commit my, question, my line of questioning to memory and circle back after they've had an opportunity to answer these specific questions or react to these comments. So uh, we welcome feedback uh, from the comments that Councilmember Herbold, myself, and Councilmember Swan have made just in terms of how we are actually helping to serve folks at the point in time which we're asking them to move out of the right way. Having biked in uh, repeatedly over the last few weeks and seen individuals sleeping by the railroad tracks down in Soto, I know how important it is for people to both get out of the right of way for their safety as well as the safety of the public. So yes, we agree that that's an important component, but as we're serving, well, as we're meeting people in their current place, um, how are we serving them with getting them actually into the care that we've promised through this team? Well, let me just say one thing that I'd like to call on SPD and Parks to talk about what they've been doing with the obstruction. Uh, first of all, uh, our mantra and our training for all of our bike and community officers has been, it's perfectly fine for you to stay here. Your equipment that is obstructing the public right-of-way can't. So that's, that's, that has been our absolute approach all the way through. It's a public right-of-way. You can stay here as long as you'd like. Your tent that is obstructing a wheelchair, like my neighbor, uh, can't stay here. Uh, and secondly, I would just say that uh, uh, the officers, the bike patrol and community police officers uh, that have been engaged in this always have, when they are able to have a specific engagement with a person, have offered services, and the system navigators are always available to come to follow up on that referral. Lieutenant, do you have That's any helpful. comments? Thank you. Uh, good morning. C. Navinger from the Seattle Police Department. So when we were talking about arrest, our arrest, um, that, is, that is the last resort. That is not never the first option on our arrest. And like the deputy mayor had just stated, it, it's about the property and blocking the right-of-way access. Um, we want to move that property. It's not about the person, it's about the property. So people can use the sidewalk for its intended purpose. That's what we're looking at. And on personal observations, I've gone on many on the weekend work as well. Um, we've called for the system navigators. Uh, the navigation team does do a deeper outreach. We're centered around the unhoused. Uh, we do assertive outreach in that case. Um, and I've been on scene where we've actually called system navigator every scene that I've been on that we have called for the system navigator to assist us. And they've done um, excellent work. Thank you very much. And did you have something else to add? Just thought I could share a little bit about our experience since the seven day coverage and the uh, system navigators came on board. Um, as you know, in addition to supporting the 72 hour uh, notice claims and the right of way work, we also remove obstructions or hazards on parks property. And uh, that could be anything from having campers take over dugouts in our play fields or um, restricting use of pea patches. Recently, we had a great partnership with the SPD officers, the system navigators, and the bioclean contractors at Lower Woodland, where those picnic shelters have been taken out of use um, right before the busy season, where we also have not only family and community events, but we also host our summer pop our special population summer camp there. And the team came out. It was one of our first experiences with the system navigators who already knew the campers by name, um, did engage with them very well and shared a lot of insight with our staff and going forward with the, um, the activity that day. So um, we have had a good experience with them and uh, we have some of the hardest working staff in the Parks Department here that do that small but mighty work. So we appreciate their, their time and the uh, partnership with these other agencies to get the public spaces back for public use. Absolutely, thank you. Um, Councilmember Gonzalez, go ahead with your questions and we'll see if there's any other comments. Great, thank you, Chair. Um, I have um, just some additional questions and, and I'm in need of some clarification. 
as it relates to the system navigators and the role that they play and when they play it. So um, if we can go to slide whatever, because I don't, these are not numbered, that one. Yes, so the first bullet point on there says, two new system navigators positions to conduct advance and day of outreach to encampments, including connections to services and shelters such as tiny house villages, enhanced shelters, and basic shelter. Um, I read that correctly, right? That's what it says? All right, so I, I want to emphasize that my understanding of how the system navigators work is related to doing advance and day of outreach to encampments um, that are going to be subject to a 72 hour notice of removal. Is that accurate? No, not always. They're uh, uh, available to uh, join when there's any kind of uh, obstruction hazard. It could be a same day, it can be a planned event, uh, but it is, it, it, they are not restricted to only a 72 hour uh, large cleanup. So when you say that they're not restricted to a 72 hour cleanup, that just means that there's nothing in the law or the policy that prohibits how they are used, which is to be distinguished from how they're actually used. So we still have a, a contract partnership with the REACH team and still very much engage them on our planned 72 hour or more uh, cleanup. So there is an engagement, a prolonged days long engagement uh, with that, uh, the REACH outreach team uh, uh, is, is, is used as a member of the, the navigation team uh, when those sites are identified. Um, the navigation, uh, the system navigators uh, are an additional resource and often are on site the day of a clean but they can also uh, be a resource to uh, park staff or SPD uh, or the utility staff uh, when uh, there is an obstruction to a public right of way and the individual needs to connect to services. Right. They can be. They are. They are. Okay, because you keep saying they can be or there's no restrictions. I'm trying to get a clear answer on whether they are in fact being utilized in the method that you have described as it relates to the um, uptick in the number of, um, of sweeps that are being deemed as obstructions in the right of way and therefore not entitled to or subject to the 72 hour notice. Yeah, I think uh, Parks SPD, you can speak to, you know, when you make those calls and when they, how they respond. I, I, that's not my question. I didn't ask when you make the call. I'm asking if you, in fact, utilize the system navigators in the way that you've just described as it relates to obstruction and people who have already been deemed to be in, in uh, obstruction of a right of way. Yes, and SPD and Parks make that call and they work in partnership with the system navigator. So I was saying they're in the best position to speak to what that looks like on the ground. Well, I wanna get to the point that, you know, Interim Director Johnson, I heard you say that in the instances, and, and I think we need to be really careful here. There, there are two different categories of, of encampment cleanups that are occurring that fall under the auspices of the navigation team. One are the things, are, are the encampments that are still subject to a 72 hour notice and those are treated on a different track. The others, the other track is the track that is not subject, is not subject to the 72 hour removal notice because uh, agencies have determined under the MDARS that they are an obstruction to the right of way and impeding the intended use of those public spaces, whether it's a park or a sidewalk, whatever the case might be. So it's, I'm not engaging in a debate with you or any of you at the table about that particular component. I, I am just honestly trying to get an understanding of how the system navigators are used in those two various tracks. And so I heard you say a moment ago that 
you haven't really needed to use system navigators in the obstruction scenario because they're complying and or are not interested in engaging in services. Oh, let me see if I can And respond. so the question is directed to Interim Director Johnson, yeah. who made the comment that because in the instances of those individuals who are deemed to be obstructions and receive no notice, they are complying, i.e. they're voluntarily willing to move out of the space, there is no need to use system navigators, at least as it relates to in advance of the cleanup actually occurring. And so I just want to make sure that I understand that that is what in fact is occurring. What is occurring is that when uh, SPD is uh, uh, engaging with someone who is causing an obstruction on public right of way, they immediately contact the uh, system navigator. That system navigator is uh, uh, made available to the individual, um, and the, it, the system navigator is engaging with that individual to see what services that individual needs. Sometimes those services are storage of belongings. Sometimes those services are a variety of connections to different kind of services. It's not always to shelter. Um, but the services that are offered also include shelter. So we are very much engaging with and calling on our system navigators to be the ones to have that conversation with individuals, whether it's an obstruction, hazard, whether it's at a park on a sidewalk, uh, and we are also including uh, an engagement with the system navigator on the day of some uh, larger planned 72-hour cleans. So walk me through these slides that you have in this presentation that communicate to me or the public um, the instances and the timing of when a system nav navigator is utilized in advance of the removal occurring. The last line. Yeah, so ask your question once again. So Looking in this for? instance right here on that last page, which I yeah. think is what you've pulled up, it says system navigators, 91 total engagements, yep. 83 unique individuals. So that means that one of the 83 or some of the 83 were engaged more than one time, right? Correct. Okay. On the second point, it says that there were, out of those 83 unique individuals who received 91 total engagements, 20, there were 20 total referrals to shelter for 18 unique individuals. So really only 18 individuals received referrals to some form of shelter. Um, so I, I am trying to understand at what point, are these, are these, is this data in, under the system navigator's point, are those for individuals who were subjected to the 72 hour requirement for removals or are these for individuals who were removed as a result of a determination that they were in an encampment that was presenting an obstruction consistent with the MDAR rules? It's both. Separate them out for me. Uh, I would have to get back with you with that data, but this is inclusive of uh, both those activities, uh, but specific to the system navigators. Okay. So by when do you think you can get that follow-up information to me? Yeah. I do, it shouldn't be difficult to tease out. Okay. Well, setting aside difficulty, by when do you think you can get that information yeah, to me? Uh, probably by the end of the day. Great. I look forward to receiving that information. And I think the, I think it's really important for us to make sure that as we are receiving and publicly reporting this information, that we're being really clear as to um, the work that system navigators are doing, which have effectively replaced REACH, um, to get a really clear understanding of whether they are effectively navigating people through the system, it's important for us to understand how many of these folks are engaging um, in the sort of obstruction context and how many, how many of these uh, folks are being engaged and what the outcomes are as it relates to um, those who are in the sort of 72 hour slower removal context. I just think that's an important data point for us to understand. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councilmember Gonzalez. Looking down the line for additional comments on this. Um, do you want one last comment? Just very quickly, uh, because um, Interim Director Jason Johnson wasn't there when we uh, discussed this before, 
I think it was in Councilmember Herbal's committee about reach, and since Councilmember Gonzalez brought that up, I just wanted to read a couple of extracts of the letter that reach wrote to uh, Mr. Johnson on January 16th of this year in which they say that REACH has serious concerns about being the primary outreach team embedded in the navigation team and that the work of the navigation team is often not in alignment with our programs, meaning REACH's values or generally accepted outreach best practices. And we would like to have an outreach contact that is more similar to the other agencies contacted by the city for outreach services. And then one of their Concerns is that the navigation team work is focused on shelter referrals, many of which are not an, not an appropriate fit for residents in the encampments. Our staff, REACH staff, have been told to pri prioritize shelter offers even when they are rarely accepted rather than developing longer term alternative housing plans. Uh, also, uh, increased uh, the that navigation team has, has increased designation and enforcement of emphasis zones, obstructions, and hazards and that REACH staff have experienced increased mistrust from clients as they see the REACH team associated with rapid encampment removal and more law enforcement. We do not need see a movement in the navigation team operations towards more trauma-informed, person-centered outreach as was discussed last year. I just wanted to say that in, in as part of our meeting proceedings today because I don't believe that the Human Services Department or the navigation team as a whole have really responded to REACH's very significant concerns in any way whatsoever, and I and I really and I don't want them to be forgotten. We, we need some responses, maybe not today, but soon. What was the date on that letter, just so we all have? The the letter was dated January 16, 2019. Thank you very much. So I'm going to say thank you uh, for providing this data. Um, I want to say first thank you to uh, the incredible work of the folks at the Department of Parks and Recreation for all of their work. We know that they're. Yay! <laughs> um, there, there's folks in the audience and there's folks who are potentially watching and please express our appreciation for their ongoing work um, at parks. Uh, uh, thank you to SPD for your words acknowledging that being without a house is not a crime and that you really are looking for ways to help make sure people are out of the right away. Appreciate that and for underscoring, I think um, maybe even clarifying that this council's um, not interested in tying the hands of anybody, but also that we recognize the right for people to be able to continue with their lives if they're not com committing a crime and it is not a crime to be homeless. So thank you for underscoring that point and for um, being here with us today. Um, thank you to uh, you both in advance. Um, I, Tess, I feel like we left you on the end there. If you had anything else to say, I know you'll be at the next presentation. But Interim Director uh, Johnson and Deputy Mayor Mosley, appreciate you getting back to us on the specific data points on engagement as Councilmember Gonzalez and others have commented on so that we can have better data on how we are connecting individuals, whether they are within the 72-hour notice or not within the 72-hour no notice, to true systems navigators and looking at the outcome from those interactions. Um, and also to my point earlier, to providing in this last slide here an actual example of where we are navigating folks to. That will be very helpful as we look at month over month data and especially as we transition to our next topic, which is the regional governance effort. Um, uh, lastly, just to have two quick questions. Uh, we have seen reports online of this see a tent, report a tent postings that are occurring across the city. I do not believe that this was the intended use of the Find It, Fix It app, and I understand that this is not a poster that's been generated from the city of Seattle or the HSD department. So just to reiterate and clarify for the record, um, the city, is, is it correct that the city is not paying for the use uh, and printing of the see a tent, report a tent um, postings? That is correct. That's not a HSD document. This is not an HSD document. This is not a city initiative. This is not the intent of the Find It, Fix It app. And when someone does use the um, app in this inappropriate way, what is our response to people who've tried to use the app in this inappropriate way? Is, is it being captured in some way, and are we doing anything with that data? Yeah, so uh, the Find It, Fix It app is um, uh, FAS's, uh, it's a FAF's function, but uh, <clears throat> you can use the Find It, Fix It app to report all sorts of things from a pothole to litter, 
Um, but also, if there you know, is a, uh, someone that you're concerned with uh, who's sleeping outdoors, it is also a way to uh, get that on the navigation team's radar. Um, so it was through the Find It, Fix It app that um, uh, we can be alerted uh, to someone who's in distress and uh, needs a connection to services. Is there a better way for us to notify folks of uh, maybe the um, uh, medical unit that Councilmember Bagshaw and I talk a lot about, folks who might actually need medical services? It doesn't. This does not feel like an appropriate use of the app. And is there a better way for us to that actually, is, as a city, not use the app in this inappropriate way? Yeah. Anyone in medical need with medical needs should. Call 911, not yeah. 311. Thank you very um, much. And uh, the Find It, Fix It app is is not for medical emergencies. Uh, Councilmember Swan. Uh, I understand it's not for emergencies, and for emergencies, people should call 911. Nevertheless, uh, outside of that, I just don't think it's appropriate for the city to formally or informally. Uh, sanction members of the public to call the Find It Fix or use the Find It Fix It app to report homeless community members. That's just not appropriate because that Im it contains the implication that home homeless people are the problem, and that that needs to be fixed. Uh, and I think that this, um, I think what needs to happen is the Human Services Department and the Mayor's Office, the Executive, have to find a way to let it be known to the public that that is not how we look at homeless people, uh, that's not the city's point of view, and that, uh, and to go Chair Mosqueda's point, that there's another way that people can uh, let the city know. Thank you for clarifying that that is not how the city intended to use the Find It, Fix It app, that this is not um, city-generated posters, and that we don't condone the use of the Find It, Fix It app in this way. And maybe we can follow up with you um, prior to the next meeting or uh, by, before the end of the day on how we are doing a better job of informing folks of the rights that you just talked about. I appreciate, again, you underscoring the difference between obstruction and trying to find a place for folks to live safely uh, and look forward to working with you on the multiple data requests we've talked about this morning. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to transition to item number three, if that sounds good. Uh, colleagues? Okay, great. Uh, Faride, if you could read into the record item number three, that would be great. And I know, Tess, you are staying at the table with us. Um, go ahead, Faride. Agenda item three, regional homelessness governance, governance update for briefing and discussion. Well, I want to say thank you to Jeff Sims for staying at the table with us for this entire presentation today, Tess Colby for staying at the table. Welcome, Tracy Ratcliffe, and thank you again for staying, um, Interim Director Johnson. Uh, I don't think we need to do official introductions because I just said your, your names. Um, today we have included in this agenda item a central staff memo. Perhaps we could get the memo online just for folks who want to see it in the audience. Uh, the select committee proposed timeline, the proposed regroup of functions that would stay here at the city or potentially be moved to a regional authority, and the regional action plan um, overview that TESS is going to provide for us. Um, do you want me to say a few opening comments and before turning it over to you, um, looking at you, Tess, is that okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, I just want to say thank you to our council colleagues. We've included um, uh, this item in our agenda to make sure that we all feel comfortable with the, both the proposed timeline and the conversation as it's evolved so far. And want to underscore that no decisions have been made as we've engaged with conversations with our uh, colleagues who are at the King County Council and our con colleagues at Sound Cities who are uh, leaders, elected leaders in various uh, other cities in the county, we've underscored repeatedly that no final decisions have been made yet about the creation of a regional governance committee. Um, and as we've been meeting, there was just one meeting last month um, with some of our colleagues both from King County and the Sound Cities, we've all underscored that we all need to feel comfortable with moving forward as a collective body. Uh, so want to make sure people hear that today from me as both the presiding chair of this select committee and as an individual who's been participating on what we call the quote client group, recognizing there's no actual individuals who experience homelessness on that client group. The client group is actually us as council colleagues and there's a similarly named group at King County Council who has 
county colleagues on that group to get informed on the various conversations that are occurring uh, between the two executive bodies and with the various researchers and entities who've been um, evaluating uh, the possibility of creating a regional governance group similar to what we've seen in Los Angeles, similar to what we've seen in um, the county that includes Portland, Moulton, Moulton, Multnomah County. I apologize to our friends from Oregon. Um, so we really appreciate the presentation here today and Tess um, for running through with us the various elements that are in motion. It's been challenging, I think, to identify on paper a document that incorporates all of the moving parts and appreciate your continued work with us to try to make sure that we can visually see how this is all going to come together. But there is a real commitment here, I believe, from our council and the colleagues that we've talked to in King County. No one wants to move the deck chairs around. We want to see true transformational change and reductions in duplication, streamlining service, and most importantly, that we get those indicators right. We will know we are successful when we continue to see fewer people who are sleeping homeless and not because we've swept them out of sight, not because we've swept poverty out of sight, but we've truly created shelters, enhanced shelters, and housing for folks. So that is our indicators of success, and um, look forward to hearing from you. Terrific. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. That was very helpful. Um, so indeed, uh, my presentation this morning is about giving you a sense of the work that we've been done, doing to date, uh, and more importantly, the work that we have ahead of us. So um, as uh, Chair Mosqueda mentioned, we have uh, a client group that has, been re that has been meeting frequently. In fact, the client group has been kind enough to agree to meet slightly more frequently as we go into what is really the, the last sprint to get to regional governance. Um, let me, um, let me start by talking about the work that we're doing about actually standing up the new regional authority. Um, in order to do that, and I've mentioned this at prior meetings, we need to, we the, the city and the county need to um, enter into an interlocal agreement. And in addition to that, the county will be uh, passing a charter that actually does the legal work of standing up the entity. Um, our law department is working with Pacifica Law Group um, because they have substantial experience in setting up uh, these kinds of entities, public development authorities. Um, and in doing that, they are working first on uh, the documents of drafting the documents, specifically the interlocal agreement, but also the charter. Um, I will say that um, the key aspects of the interlocal agreement uh, will be an agreement with the county regarding the board structure, um, and that really um, includes, uh, the board structure includes the kind of experience uh, and representation that they will bring to the board. That governing board will if you think of a nonprofit, that governing board will be in the same vein as a board of directors for a nonprofit, although the PDA is not a nonprofit. Um, in terms of providing uh, policy guidance and fiduciary responsibility for the entity moving forward. The other thing that we're looking at uh, and considering is an advisory committee structure that would ensure that there's a broad array of um, voices, experience, um, perspectives that are represented in the overall governance structure. The um, ILA has some specific information that it will contain. Uh, the, one of them is the baseline number of FTEs or personnel that the, both the county and the city will transition to the authority. And that baseline is likely to uh, be based on a minimum number of people that are needed to staff basic administration functions, such as HR and IT, um, but also to manage the contracts that will be transferred. Um, to that end, uh, in terms of the, the um, contracts that will be transferred and the administrative functions. The um, ILA will also note the budget that the county and the city will be committing to it. And again, the, uh, the initial commitment uh, from both the county and the city really is, again, for sort of baseline um, administrative functions and the contracted programs as are currently, uh, uh, um, currently considered to be 
transferred. Um, and I'll be talking about that in a second. Um, and then finally, these documents will identify where the authority will actually be located um, and what it'll take to stand it up. So in preparation for providing this uh, very specific information, um, HSD and the mayor's office has been working with um, HR, HR departments, both the city's HR department, but also HSD's HR staff, um, as well as labor to develop communications plans for HSI staff and a transition plan to move personnel to the new authority. We expect to have that um, completed or uh, in, a, um, in a final, the plan itself in a final format towards the latter part of August. Um, a critical component of doing this work is developing new job descriptions and a basic skeleton of what the authority's organizational chart will look like. Um, so as part of their scope of work, uh, NIS, the National Innovation Services, is preparing the first drafts of these for consideration. Once we have job classifications, uh, there will be a crosswalk between current, uh, between our current HSD job descriptions and the new ones that are considered. And that's really important work in uh, terms of figuring out what the crossover will look like between uh, those and existing job descriptions, those new ones and the existing. HS, on the subject of contracts and programs, HSD and the county have come to an agreement uh, about the programs that they think should be transitioned over to the new authority. Um, and I believe you have a copy of a memo that's dated uh, July 11th that actually shows you individually all of the programs that uh, are, consider, are under consideration for transferring over. Um, the short answer to that question is basically all of the um, all of the uh, uh, crisis response programs uh, will be transferred over, with the exception of um, up. Well, so the crisis response programs will be uh, transferred over, um, including everything from prevention to support services related to permanent supportive housing. Um, the main programs that won't be trans transferred are what are considered upstream prevention programs that are, in essence, anti-poverty programs. Um, food banks, for example, are a, a good example of those kinds of upstream um, anti-poverty type programs. We, um, we also are not considering uh, sending over the navigation team. However, the outreach function of that we are thinking about putting in the new authority. Um, and that's really because, as was discussed today, the outreach in advance of doing any kind of navigation work is extremely important. Um, and we feel like that should be part of an overall continuum of outreach services, which would actually be one of the responsibilities of the new authority to ensure that there's good, good uh, coordination among all of our outreach contractors. Pause there just for a quick second. Any mm -hmm. questions from our colleagues? Okay. I, I have a few questions about that that I will be following up with you on, um, specific as, uh, specifically as it relates to what would the role of a navigation team be with a potential joint governance structure that is intending to consolidate our services for those who are experiencing homelessness and preventing homelessness. It seems like there is a, a direct nexus there. Um, so I think this is the first time I'm hearing that. Yeah. I'm happy to, to answer okay. that and we'll let um, Interim Director Johnson uh, jump in should I need assistance with that. So we understand the navigation team to be critical as for in terms of the city's response to addressing homelessness and specifically helping folks who are living outside uh, get access to shelter and other sort other resources as has been described before you today the navigation team is a program that's unique uh, to the city of Seattle we Seattle we are not aware of other jurisdictions that are interested in um, 
that, that have the resources for or that are interested in the same approach that we are taking. Um, so that's one of the reasons that we feel like it's important for the city to uh, continue to run that program. Additionally, this, the navigation team involves a number, it's an interdepartmental team, um, and as a result of that, we really feel that it is appropriate to keep it within the city infrastructure. Okay. Thank you. Um, if we have other questions on that, we'll follow up with you. Okay. And can I offer one um, uh, reframe? I think that at the beginning you said uh, the executives have come to agreement on what will be transferred. Uh, is it accurate to say come to agreement on what would be proposed to yes. the councils on what would be transferred? Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sorry, I thought I used that as a recommendation. Uh, so they are making a recommendation. This uh, The chart that's... Uh, on the screen in front of you is uh, part of that recommendation. And in order to get to this recommendation, county staff and city staff needed to work together. Thank you. Um, so the other piece of this work that has been discussed uh, before this committee previously is the regional action plan. And I just want to um, remind us all sort of what the regional action plan is. Um, and in fact, uh, prior to this particular presentation today, uh, Chair Mosqueda very appropriately noted that the Regional Action Plan, one of its most important uh, uh, functions will be in establishing region-wide performance metrics um, and then being accountable to the achievement of those metrics. Um, so the plan is being developed by a nonprofit named CSH, um, and they are in advance of preparing this document and providing a draft to us doing extensive outreach to stakeholders across the county. This is a regional plan, as the name uh, implies, that is addressing homelessness region-wide. So CSH has um, really made a big effort to make sure that Part of the um, outreach is with providers and organization and uh, government staff and uh, the Sound Cities Association to reach really all perspectives. Um, the regional action plan will be a community plan. Um, so it won't, while it will be uh, informing what the regional action, or excuse me, the regional governance does, um, it is not the sole uh, jurisdiction of that authority. Um, it's intended to provide action-oriented solutions uh, and really uh, taking into consideration the information that they've gained through the community engagement process, through data analysis, and also looking at the 10 goals that were brought to us last year, or early this year from the NIS uh, report that they did last year. It will lay out metrics and milestones and, and uh, a methodology to track those. Um, it will um, note who is accountable, whether that is an agency, a provider, or in some cases, individuals that are accountable for uh, meeting those metrics and meeting those um, specific established goals. Um, it will provide recommendations on sequencing um, of the achievement of those goals, and I'll talk about that in a second as well. Um, it's doing, so CSH is working uh, internally uh, to do a lot of cost estimates. So obviously a plan that doesn't have um, accompanying budgets and cost estimates really doesn't get us very far down the road. Um, and so those project costs, uh, projected costs for interventions will really serve as an underpinning for the budgets that the authority will seek, the budget authority they will seek from the city and the county and any other jurisdiction that um, becomes a, uh, a member of or a part of the regional entity. Can I ask a quick question on that budgeting? Uh, point. I think everybody is interested in success. There's no question in our minds that providing services and having more housing is really the goals, two of the goals that we're trying to achieve. How do we have some confidence that no matter how much money we budget, we're actually going to be able to move forward to accomplish these goals? 
It, that's an excellent question. I think the intent of the regional action plan is really to provide us with short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals, um, and the, the actual steps in order to take that and to, to meet those goals. Um, the first thing that the um, authority will be asked to do is um, essentially create a strategic plan of its own and an and annual work plans that will be informed by and be in alignment with the regional action plan so that er, those early goals will be about establishing plans and procedures for doing exactly what you have described, which is um, making sure that there is a, a clear and uh, transparent process for tracking uh, progress. Um, in the midterm, the goals could be, uh, and again, this hasn't been decided, but the, the goals could be tracking, for example, reductions in the amount of time folks uh, spend experiencing homelessness. It could also be um, uh, looking at ways in which we can reduce the number of people who are coming into homelessness and increase the number of people who are leaving uh, to permanent housing. The long-term goals, I think, are really the North Star. And the long-term goals could be, for example, um, uh, goals to achieve or make meaningful progress towards reducing homelessness among specific populations. This is an approach that communities take all across the country. Um, it has many different names, uh, but for example, there have been a number of campaigns, if you will, about reducing the number of folks who are youth uh, or veterans or unsheltered specific populations so that they can be targeted so that the um, the progress towards achieving those goals can be tracked and tracked publicly. Um, what we expect of the new authority is that much in the same way that All Home has created uh, a dashboards that both provide system level analysis and, and metrics, but also dig down into the intervention level and program level. We would expect the authority to be able to do this and because it will be a regional authority to be able to carve out data as needed for the individual jurisdictions across the county. Great. Um, Tess, thank you for that. I know that's, we're all anxious to see that. Uh, I also want to acknowledge you know, what King County has done around familiar faces, and we are also doing some of that. I think digging down and making sure that we know for each individual that we're touching, are we making improvement? Mm -hmm. Is that person just getting sort of shuffled around, or are we saying that we're able to address the individual needs, that person-centered approach we all have been talking about? Yeah, and that uh, really is the one of the reasons that we're excited about the authority. Um, as Mark Jones has previously described, and I'm happy to uh, reiterate it as often as I can, the authority will uh, have the responsibility for ensuring that client voice, that customer voice, is at the center of all of the work that it does. Um, and uh, there's both the need to make sure that those people who are experiencing homelessness and who have prior experience with homelessness are a part of the authority. Um, in addition, uh, we know that there are populations who are disproportionately represented among homeless populations and making sure that we are taking an equity lens and that the authority uh, in every step of the work that it does is looking at both the needs of customers and that disproportionality meeting the needs of customers and um, having meaningful impact on disproportionality will be critical for the success of the authority. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Bagshaw. Councilmember Herbold, any questions? Okay. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Did you have more? I was the one that interrupted. Sorry. No, you're, you're both okay because actually uh, that was the extent of the update that I wanted to give today. Okay. Um, uh, Tracy and Jeff, thank you both very much for being at the... Um, a high number of meetings that we've had, both internal to the city and with King County. Um, are there any other comments from you on terms of framing, next steps, 
Um, if we could go to the time frame that was also outlined uh, in the memo, um, any additional comments from you, things that you'd like us to have on our radar? So the only thing that's not showing up on that schedule is obviously the, the RAP needs to come back to the Select Committee for their consideration as well. The client group will see a draft of that in August, I believe, but I think we would expect that the Select Committee would also like to see a draft, um, a draft and final draft particularly as they consider the ILA and the charter, and I think we've talked enough about that so that we understand that that's planned. It's, it probably just needs to be updated on the schedule there. Okay, that sounds Those very helpful. hand in hand. Okay, so we will get that updated timeline uh, to our council colleagues. I know we've seen it uh, a little bit more built out time frame presented in the client group, so we'll share that with our council colleagues. Um, I would love to check in with um, our central staff, with the council colleagues here and not here today about the comment uh, around potentially retaining the navigation team. Um, to me, I think it just raises a few more questions that I haven't had the chance to ask you about, so uh, potentially follow up with you afterwards about what that looks like and additional questions about the rationale. Great. Any other comments? Um, just one thank you. Obviously you're doing so much work on this and I really appreciate everybody at the table for just digging in. And we of course are working on a fast track schedule because as we've all talked about a number of us aren't going to be here next year and we would really like to see this move forward in 2019. Also I just want to say thank you. You've been a fantastic co-chair. I appreciate working with you. you and also um, council member Jeannie Cole Wells and Rod Dambowski, um, Joe McDermott were with us uh, last week when we got together from King County and Nancy Bacchus from Auburn has been a wonderful uh, co-pilot through all of this and I just want to raise again that Sound Cities um, really wants to be involved. They would like as much as possible to be on the front end and not here at the tail end, oh by the way this is it, this is it and here it is. Mm -hmm. So if we can just um, reach out to Sound Cities if, as well as we're just keeping them informed of what's going on. Thank, Thank you. you. And thanks to Councilmember Up the Grove too for being there. Yeah. Yeah, Councilmember Up the Grove was there as well. Thank you for that. And um Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I know there will probably be more questions as we get into the later part of the summer and uh, as we carry out the timeline that's been presented. Um, I want to make sure that everybody feels well informed, um, including not just council colleagues, but the public. Speaking of the public, we have the remainder of the time for public testimony. Thank you Thank all you. for uh, waiting. Thank you, Council okay. Member. No problem. Um, really interested to hear your feedback on what you potentially heard today as well. Uh, so we will go ahead and move into public comment. Um, and uh, Faride, if you could also give us a minute and a half on the calendar, on the uh, timer, recognizing that we know folks have a lot to say and you may have written comments, so we're happy to accept those as well. Thank you. Thank um, you. And thank you all for being here, and I apologize for that. That's okay. Thank we you. will pass on notes, Great. and I know that thank it's you. available online. So the first three people to testify are Jerome Snell. I'm sorry, Jerome. Thank you. Oh, no, it's okay. You tell me how to correct it. Thank you so much. And then behind you will be Aaron Goodman and then Janine Kulvacek. Thank you for the writing it out for me. I'm sure I need help with it still. Welcome. Good. Thank you for waiting for us. One second so that we can get you the full time. Um, and thank you, Councilmember Herbold, for sticking around. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. A minute and a half. You know what? Go ahead. Uh, go ahead and... Um, Go ahead and bring it to We'll try and get through everybody. Go ahead, sir. Yes. All right. I just wanted to come here and share um, what I feel is the only solution to this homelessness problem. And I've, I've got to just, this was time for five minutes and two seconds, so I'm going to try to get it all in all right. quick here. We'll take it in writing, too. Let me move on. So I've done my homework, and I've gone around, and I've talked to folks in these tent camps and homeless shelters and, and the little houses and all that, and I've uh, got their feedback, and I talked to doctors and chemical dependency specialists, uh, police officers, and so on and so forth. Uh, let me move on here. I just wanted to get right to it. Let me get... Uh, so... Washington State owns 27 plus acres over on McNeil Island. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, and there's also a, a correctional facility there as well. 
um, we, we just need to do a little building. And uh, I represent our life. Sorry, I'm jumping all over the place. <laughs> uh, we would like to build a drug uh, addiction center there. And we would like to build a mental health center there as well as a Center for Alcoholism and Job Training Center. We would also like to build housing for 20,000 people. And that's just green cots. That's just the same thing they have here, but in the circular motion. Um, and the only difference is that uh, we would have showers, we would have toilets, that kind of thing. And we would like to have a brand new ferry designed just for this purpose, and that is to transport large amounts of people, okay, to the island. Thank you, Jerome. I'm going to have to cut you off there, but we will happily take your written material because I know you put oh a lot of work into it. Oh, my gosh. Let me finish. I'm so sorry, sir. You owe me three minutes from last time. Let me finish. I don't, I, I am happy to let you conclude. How about we, a minute? How about we, a minute? We really need to have you conclude. Do you, if you have one more summary statement. Okay. One more summary statement. I won't go through the funding. I'll just say this. I would like to see Seattle and the state of Washington be the model for the nation and bringing back the, its lost brothers and sisters from drug addiction and, and, and bring them back to be productive citizens. I would like to see them connect and reconnect with family members and friends and stuff through the treatment program that we would set up over at McNeil Island. This is worth more than the riches that uh, everybody is talking about here. Okay. Thank you, Jerome. We're happy to take your summary statement. Eric, Aaron Goodman, followed by Jeannie Kovalchek, followed by Bruce Gorgel. Thank you. Aaron? Okay. Um, Jenny? Jenny? Did I say that wrong? Bruce? Hi, Bruce. And happy to take your summary as well when you're done. Thank you. Good afternoon, okay. council members. My name is Bruce Gogol. I'm the elected Nicholsville head of security at Othello Tiny House Village. Othello was bum rushed by Low Income Housing Institute paid security on April 8, 2019, and they have occupied us ever since. We are on strike. In a recent interview with My Northwest radio reporter Carolyn Osario, Sharon Lee, director of the Low Income Housing Institute, described my testimony and the testimony of many other people from Nicholsville over the last three months as badgering. Other Lehigh management staff has told me that your response to our testimony was meaningless. Lehigh management at a recent camp meeting told residents that they would not negotiate with Nicholsville and in no way would they come to mediation. Their refusal to complete an MOU that is 95% finished is negligent considering the crisis in Seattle. It's time to end the stranglehold Lehigh has had not only on Nicholsville but you council members. Sharon Lee is a coward who hides behind her organization's years of good work. She is using past success to cover up her present failures. HSD is responsible for allowing Lehigh to monopolize sanctioned encampments. HSD every step of the way has violated the city ordinance, ignored the director's rule, and as allies with Lehigh are guilty of many of the false allegations against Nicholsville. It is HSD who are bullies and have targeted the truth. It is they who have lied to the city council, the general public, and worst of all themselves. Last Friday, Lisa Gustavuson, an HSD staff person who worked under the sweep star Jackie St. Louis until he quit on Friday, told a share worker something very shocking. HSD staff person Lisa Gustavuson told him that HSD was shutting down North Lake Nicholsville and would shut down Othello too if we didn't fire our staff person. For good measure, she told the share worker that HSD would never renew a contract with share for indoor shelters if they didn't fire this specific staff person. On Friday, Nicholsville and Writing offer another HSD staff person the opportunity to review all the bar paperwork at Nicholsville Othello anytime in any place. That is the same offer that Director Sharon Lee has ignored. The reason is because it would disprove many of her allegations. Transparency she seeks is within her grasp, yet she has chosen to ignore it. It's time to end this disgrace and hold HSD and Lehigh accountable for their deception with audits and sanctions. The truth will be revealed whether it's badgered or not. Please insist on mediation between HSD, Lehigh, and Nicholsville. If they keep refusing, please expose both to in sanctions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Peggy Ho Holtz, followed by Jess Mayuk, followed by Heather Staples. And Peggy? Jess? Jess Mayuk. Uh, okay. Peggy? 
Do we have Peggy? Hi, Peggy. I don't know which one is better for me. That's great. You can hear me? Good afternoon, council members. My name is Peggy Holtz, and I'm a Nicholsville founder and a volunteer. A month ago, we left these chambers excited and optimistic after your express support for mediation between Nicholsville, Lehigh, and HSD. We scarcely had time to exit City Hall before Lehigh and HSD dismissed the council, saying they had no intention of mediating with Nicholsville. A few days ago, we were told by a Share 2 worker who had met with HSD staffer Lisa Gustavuson that HSD is planning to close Nicholsville Othello unless we fire a particular staff person. According to Dis Gustavuson, Nicholsville Northlake, which is running splendidly, by the way, will be also be closed. How is this helping the homeless people who live there? I will remind you, too, that when HSD closed Licton Springs, Gustavuson promised that everyone would get housing, and they did not, only about half of them. Just yesterday, I spoke to a woman who's living with her partner at Othello Village, formerly from Licton Springs. Wouldn't the adult thing to do be to sit down and talk face to face with us, with the mediator? And since when does Lehigh, excuse me, does HSD get to dictate who the service providers choose to employ? How arrogant, how shameful for a human services department staffer to threaten and bully the very people they're supposed to be helping and protecting. Does HSD treat every service provider this way? This is a rhetorical question because you know the answer or only the two small grassroots organizations run by homeless people who speak truth to power. Please take the steps necessary to stop this madness and get HSD and Lehigh to mediate with Nicholsville. Thank you. Thank you, Peggy. And I'll follow up with you as well afterwards. Um, Heather Staples, Teresa Barker, and then Amy Hackenfein. Hi there. Hi, I'm in between height. Um, the one works. There you go. Hi, I'm Heather Staples. I'm the managing director at Impact Hub Seattle, and we're sort of on the forefront of operating a business and um, having a homeless community in front of our business. And I'm here actually to speak in support of the NAV team because, unfortunately, our business was one of the first co-working spaces in Seattle, and now it's one of the mo uh, this is one of the most uh, competitive communities for doing what we do. Our staff has a whole lot of compassion and interaction with the communities around us. We work closely with UGM. We work closely with Chief Seattle Club. But unfortunately, um, without the NAV team support, we were losing our customers mm -hmm. to the point where we were failing. And so I, I really appreciate the city supporting our company and supporting our ability to be a part of the Pioneer Square community. And we have found the NAV team to be very um, supportive and respectful of the people that they interact with. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here and the work that you do at Impact Hub. <laughs> Teresa Barker, Amy Ho um, Hogapine, and then uh, Eliana Scott, um, Eliana Scott and Torres. Hi there. Hi, hello, um, committee chair Mosqueda and council member Herbold and other council members. My name is Teresa Barker. We've corresponded a little bit and I'm a little nervous. So I did want to speak today uh, on the work of the NAB team in person and have a chance to share that. So as you know, I'm a resident of North Seattle in the area of Ravenna and Cowan Parks. When I first heard about the city's NAB team, I was really skeptical. The problem of homeless encampments actually seems insoluble to me, and I'm, I'm an engineer. But over the last two years, our community on all sides of the park has worked with the city in this problem. We've met with uh, twice with Rob, um, with our former uh, council member, SPD Parks. And at one of those meetings, uh, the NAV team uh, member came and spoke to us. And what we learned in our neighborhood is that they, uh, the NAV team approaches campers with compassion mm -hmm. and a heartfelt desire to provide support and assistance. They listen to their stories, they advocate for the unsheltered person, to find them sheltered, to connect them with services, and to build a relationship that leads to trust, which is what we're hearing is why so many times the services are turned down as a lack of trust due to trauma in these individuals' lives. 
We really want them to move forward with their lives. We have a neighborhood group that provides a hot meal once a week on, on the 65th Park and Ride that was modeled on the Rainier Valley meal. And um, we are uh, exquisitely aware of how vulnerable these individuals are in their tents. There's no locks on tents. They're at risk from health issues, from bad weather, from criminals who prey on them. Uh, so in our community engagement group, we have approximately 150 residents on all sides of Ravenna Park. And we um, support, our community does support the navigation team, and we believe it should be expanded to provide more services. We also need to say that safe enhanced shelters and a boatload of affordable housing has, is needed to replace what has been wiped out in the past decade. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Hi, it's Amy Hagopian. Thank you, Amy um, Hagopian. I live in the central area. Uh, so I'm here today to notice the failures in Mayor Durkin's homeless strategy, uh, which I appreciate that many of you did in today's meeting as well, um, especially the newly accelerated sweeps and the extreme disarray in which the city's Department of Human Services finds itself with frayed relationships across the city, staff who disrespect homeless people, key staff vacancies and staff resignations now on a weekly basis. Most importantly, the loss of Tiffany Washington, who headed up homeless strategy. Licton Springs Tiny House Village was swiped from the face of the earth this spring, as Peggy said, sending half its remaining residents to the streets. Rumors are the city hopes to eliminate more villages. Mm. Eleven years ago, Nicholsville organized Seattle's first democratically run encampment that sought to remain in a single place for more than 90 days. Nicholsville understands homelessness is the result of the maldistribution of power and wealth. Homelessness, homeless people need to organize their own communities with their own rules and ways to enforce those rules. I'm a public health faculty member at the UW. My graduate students spent winter quarter this year interviewing almost every li everyone living in Nicholsville's four homeless encampments. They found nearly two thirds of camp residents identified strongly as Nickelodeons. Nickel Nicholsville's accountability structures and processes build community cohesion. They help individuals develop valuable skills. Uh, they help them develop agency and personal growth. I worry about this cozy relationship with Lehigh and HSD. Um, I think Lehigh views its best alternative to a negotiated agreement as continuing on with this relationship, edging Nicholsville self-governance off the table. This council has asked for mediation at its last meeting, and yet nothing has happened to advance that idea, and I recommend you insist. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi, Eliana. Following you will be uh, Cola um, Ludwig and then John uh, Trineau, followed by Lisa Netzi. Apologies Alex. for the mispronunciations. My name is Eliana Scatthonis. I'm the chair of the Othello Village Community Advisory Committee. Um, I have a lot of comments on what happened today, but I have prepared okay. things to say. But if you could pass on my thanks to the other council members, I have never felt so well represented by the council as I did with the questions that were asked today. Thank you very much. Um, last month, I shared with you a letter signed by 11 CAC members from five different CACs, which expressed our concerns about how HSD has fallen short of our hopes in their oversight of the villages and our urgent request that you take action to address this and to bring about mediation between HSD, Lehigh, and Nicholsville. Your caring response that day was really amazing and meant a lot to me and more importantly to the residents whose voices have been too long ignored in these conversations. So thank you. Um, I'm troubled that despite the conversations several of you have had with HSD and Lehigh, that the situation has worsened over this past month. An HSD staff person has clearly stated that HSD intends to shut down Othello Village when the permits expire in September if residents continue to insist on maintaining their self-management system, and that they also intend to shut down the North Lake Village. In this homelessness crisis, shutting down branches of the city's most effective harm reduction option is a shocking disappointment. Lehigh has also chosen to publicly and privately scapegoat one Nicholsville staff person, erasing and disrespecting the voices and agency of the residents of North Lake and Othello villages. The picture they paint bears no resemblance to what I have observed. 
and I am very troubled that an agency responsible for serving the needs of so many vulnerable neighbors in a number of contexts is refusing to recognize the dignity and autonomy of these brave, determined folks. I believe the approach HSD has taken has encouraged these erasures and pressured service providers to ignore individual needs and voices in pursuit of tidy metrics and the appearance of progress. I urge you to identify what steps you can take in finding some just resolutions. We're eager to work with you on this, but need your leadership to move forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi there. Hi, my name's Kolya. I'm from Seattle, but I currently live in Los Angeles. Pleased to address the remaining two council members uh, who care to hear what Seattle thinks about this. So I came to this meeting with a couple fundamental questions, uh, none of which were really answered. Uh, the first one, is the concern of the most marginalized people in Seattle more important than the desires of the most powerful people in Seattle? Uh, the folks who profit from the gentrification that causes homelessness. Uh, that question wasn't answered. In fact, gentrification was never brought up. Uh, what we saw today was a discussion of how to manage the fallout from gentrification. So until everyone on the council is willing to make a personal sacrifice to challenge and limit the power of people who cause gentrification and profit from it, we won't address the issue of homelessness. So my second question is, what is every council member willing to sacrifice in terms of social capital, potentially their political careers, to advocate for the folks in Seattle with the least social capital? To that end, I actually propose a new metric for the online evidence-based dashboard. Number of relationships you have lost or tarnished because you have upset powerful people while advocating for homeless people. And you could operationalize that through number of angry emails you've received uh, or loss of contacts, people no longer answer your calls, things like that. Uh, just something to think about as you go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. John, followed by Lisa. Hi, John. Good morning, council member. Good morning. Um, my name is John Trevino. From I live in uh, Nicholsville, North Lake, and uh, I was here at the last uh, meeting of the Select Committee on Homelessness in June. And uh, at Nicholsville, North Lake, we've managed to remain a self-governed village and uh, do our own security, saving the city about two hundred and seventy thousand a year. If you uh, compare to what they're spending over at uh, Othello. So you guys have already heard uh, about the HSD, the, the rumors going around about shutting down North Lake and, and uh, the non-compliant Nicholsville villages. So, uh, and so on addressed uh, mediation earlier, which we appreciate, but it, it just seems like HSD and Lehigh are going to run out the clock till, till uh, the leases are up. So uh, I don't know if this is possible, but but could the city council vote to 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 demand that HSD, Nicholsville, and Lehigh get together and do mediation instead of asking? Um, we have uh, at least two people who are like gravely, like like have like life-threatening illness in our in our village. For them to lose their houses would be, you know, it, it would be a, a disaster. Mm -hmm. So, anything the council can do to remove the impediments and static and freeze between these three, uh, Lehigh. Uh, HSD and Nicholsville and, and get this done, you know, 
Thank it would you. make our lives a lot happier. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Hi, Lisa. Thanks for waiting. Hi, I'm Lisa Nitza, and I'm here to speak in favor of the mayor's navigation teams. And thank you to Councilmember Mosqueda and Herbold for the opportunity to address you and also for your terrific questions on impact metrics, which are critical and having them match up. Um, I'm here representing Nitza Stegen, a real estate developer and property manager with a history in Soto and Pioneer Square. We own and manage the Starbucks Center and restored Union Station and Merrill Place, uh, restored the Cadillac Hotel, and we're founding members of the Soto BIA and, and the Alliance for Pioneer Square. Um, and we've always had a commitment to investing in neighborhoods and working collaboratively with neighbors on public-private partnerships and addressing issues facing the neighborhood um, in order to support safe, healthy, and thriving areas. Um, we, uh, on June 14th, purchased a uh, property at 3rd and South Washington in Pioneer Square, um, an abandoned lot and building, and we're putting in 80 units of workforce housing and a retail uh, entity there. Um, and we break out ground this summer and open in 14 months, so uh, as many as 160 residents will be coming and going starting um, a year from now in that area. Um, along with having a retail store operating in the first floor. So I wanted to thank the mayor for stepping up the navigation teams, um, which have led to significant health and safety improvements uh, in that area, uh, accessible sidewalks with uh, obstructions removed, and accessible roadway for driving with obstructions removed, and garbage cleanup, which I think are going to be very helpful to um, increasing the health um, and safety of that area. We're looking forward to working with our neighbors to collectively and collaboratively, collaboratively address the needs of the area, along with the city, by taking a systems change approach that results in long-term health and stability and vibrancy and safety in the area for all. Lisa, and the o and ongoing work of the NAV team is essential to bringing this about. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for your testimony and waiting. Um, I want to thank everybody for staying and uh, testifying. And if folks do have written comments or you want to send us something later, really appreciate you doing that. I don't see anybody else running to the microphone. Um, okay, sir. We'll go ahead and have you. And then you'll be our last person to testify. David Ains, I just want to point out that the um, Find It Fix It app is being promoted by the cops around the city to bypass the 9-11 calls because being poor is not a crime, yet it's being treated like a crime. And we need to address that. But the thing is, is like when the emphasis patrols are going through, which is also proof of the war on the poor, they don't seem to have outreach. You know, they're really, it's like, and the city council, I believe, made a law that said, if you're an individual, not three people in a tent encampment, you don't get the same notification or even a 24-hour notice. So if you go to the store, to the bathroom, whatever, you come back, your stuff's gone. There's no outreach there. Mm -hmm. And I know that that deputy mayor said that when the emphasis patrols come along and start scaring people away, he says, well, we can call the navigation for you. Mm -hmm. But that navigation is not going with those emphasis patrols. A lot of times those people are like, that's it, I don't want nothing to do with it. But the thing is, you can use the data to manipulate perceived success, but it doesn't address the subhuman shelters and services. And oh, anyway, that's the thing. Thank you, David. That's very helpful. And if I you just, could just pull the microphone a little closer to you, that one that's closest. Can't do it, but okay, we got it for you. I just want to say one quick message. As you put together this new whole committee here in King County, please do not forget those with current lived experience. Yes. Involve us, include us, not a PhD that was homeless 20 years ago, but people who are living here in Seattle now that have experience with the NAV teams and other teams, as I have experience, include us and don't forget about that because sometimes a project or program or something comes on and it looks great, sounds great, but for someone who's living in their car and a car program comes around and it just doesn't work, it's not going to work. So include us. Thank you very much. Excellent point. Thank you. <clears throat> So that concludes our public testimony today. Thank you, Councilmember Herbal, and all of our other council colleagues who were here. Um, just public service announcement, the next select committee meeting on homelessness and affordability will be on August 12th at 10.30. 
following council briefing. Um, and thank you, Faride, for sharing for us today and all your good work. Uh, we will do some follow-up uh, with the individuals here who've expressed concern about the mediation. As council member Sawant mentioned at the beginning, she has taken lead on helping to coordinate folks. So we'll follow up with you on the report that she gave this morning. And then also, um, all of the questions and good ideas that came up from the council discussion. We'll make sure to circulate that and provide it to the public as well. With that, today's meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much.